So you're considering an English major. You might be surprised to know that there's more than one way to do it. Well, hey there, I hope you're doing well. Of course, given this video's title, you may be feeling the pressure of having to make a life-altering decision in a short amount of time, or you might just be somebody who's curious about what it is that people who study English actually study. Either way, I'm glad you're here because I thought it would be fun and useful to talk about what it means to major in English. And that's because when I was a high school senior who liked to write, I barreled headlong into an English major when I went to college, but I didn't actually know what I was getting myself into. Short story shorter, it wasn't what I was expecting, so when I came back for my second year of school, I came back with a different major. Of course, I'm an English professor now, so I did make my way back, but I'm also doing something very different from what I was doing that first year as a student. And I'll share some more of my experiences as we go along, but mostly I just want to give you a tour of the different options that are available to you if you decide to major in English. Because it doesn't mean that you have to sit around reading old books and trying to say erudite things about them. Unless, of course, that's what you want it to mean. But I didn't, and you might not want that either. So let's get right into talking about the different things you could be doing and studying as an English major. If you were to imagine the prototypical English major, you'd probably imagine somebody with their nose buried in Shakespeare, Jane Austen, or something like Moby Dick. They're the people who are always reading classic literature, at least when they aren't proofreading their roommates' papers. And you could be forgiven for thinking that all English majors are always reading literature. Literature studies probably make up the biggest chunk of English departments, both in terms of people and classes. And of course, if you do major in English and end up pursuing literature studies, you probably will end up reading a lot of classic literature. A huge percentage of programs require their students to take introductory courses that expose them to literature from British and American history, and they also include courses that focus on specific authors like Shakespeare or even particular genres like the novel. But there's more to it than that. Literature can be defined so broadly, and people continue to create literary things, that you're just as likely to run into classes about graphic novels or video games as you are classes about romantic poets. A lot of people sign up for an English major because they like to read, and while you're bound to be doing a lot of reading, you'll also be doing more than just reading novels and poems. That's because the people who study literature, including English majors, are interested in the way that literary texts shape and are shaped by history, culture, and other human interactions. So you'll also be spending a lot of time learning about literary theory and using that knowledge to interpret or critique literary works. I've said before that creative reading is just as much a thing as creative writing writing, and the work that you would do in a literature program is a pretty good expression of that. With that in mind, you might be tempted, as I was, to say that literary critics are just making up a bunch of things about poems or stories that the authors never intended in the first place. And that might be true on some level, but the goal is not really to make claims about what the author originally intended. Instead, students of literature use different theories, methods, or lenses, literary critics love their lenses, to draw attention to different meaningful aspects of a text. So you could end up talking about how different varieties of English are represented in 19th century American literature, you could talk about how attitudes towards science are reflected in the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or you could talk about critiques of empire in stories written in former British colonies. As an English major studying literature, you won't just be reading a lot of books. You'll also be learning a wide and diverse range of theoretical, historical, and philosophical tools for interpreting and understanding literature. That's not to say once and for all what Hamlet means, but to draw out new insights about what makes Hamlet meaningful to readers. And that's one of the things that I think is especially valuable about an English major, whatever route you end up taking. It will give you a set of tools and skills that you can use in a wide variety of contexts. So even if you don't think that reading Pride and Prejudice is very useful, the skills that you develop in reading and interpreting Pride and Prejudice can be useful for helping you to make sense of a confusing email from a client, or even just to deepen your appreciation of your favorite TV show or video game. No matter what you go on to do, the skills to understand different people, cultures, and texts that are far away from you, whether in terms of time or place, is increasingly valuable and it's something that an English major can do better than most. After literature, the next most likely thing that you might imagine an English major doing is creative writing. These aren't the people saying inscrutable things about inscrutable books. 
They're the ones writing the novels, poems, or memoirs. Like I said at the beginning, I started college as an English major because I liked writing and I wanted to get better at it. When it turned out to be a lot of reading and interpreting of literature, though, I backpedaled real hard and changed my major. But I did still want to write, so I didn't abandon English classes completely. As a result, most of the time that I spent in my school's English department was spent in creative writing classes. And it probably won't surprise you to learn that what I did in those classes was creative writing. It does what it says on the label. Most creative writing programs will focus on three core genres, fiction, poetry, and creative nonfiction. A lot of introductory classes will cover all three, but then they'll specialize in one genre or the other as you get more advanced. And those classes will generally follow the same basic pattern. You'll go to class, get some writing prompts, do some writing, bring your drafts to class, give them to your peers and teachers so that they can give you feedback, and then you go home and revise. One of the great advantages of this is that you don't spend much time talking about writing in theory. And honestly, one of the greatest drawbacks of this process is that you don't spend a lot of time talking about writing in theory. And what do I mean by that? Well, because you're looking at actual pieces of writing, it's a lot easier to see in practical terms what could go right and what could go wrong. I still have a vivid memory of one of my professors projecting somebody's poem on the board and then crossing out all the unnecessary or redundant words to show us that we can in fact say the same things with fewer words. Rather than just telling us that compression or efficiency are important Important qualities of poetry, he showed us in real time what it means to make the kinds of aggressive cuts that would tighten up our work. At the same time, though, because creative writing classes spend so much time focused on a particular piece, you might come away with a really good idea of how to fix the story that you're working on now, but you might have more difficulty translating that into improving all the other stories that you might write. Whatever happens, though, you can be sure that creative writing classes will give you an opportunity to set aside time to write and to get credit for it. Beyond that, though, they'll also give you access to a community of readers so that you can see how actual people respond to your work and the things that you're doing. Whatever happens, though, you can be sure that creative writing classes will give you an opportunity to set aside time to write and to get credit for it. Also, because peer review is often such a common part of creative writing classes, they'll also give you access to a community of readers that will give you insight into how a variety of people respond to the things you're writing and the work that you're doing. But don't think that you'll escape from reading entirely. You'll probably do less reading than if you were studying literature, but you'll still have to read some things. It will be a different kind of reading, though. For one, creative writing programs tend to emphasize the work of contemporary writers over historical ones. So you'll read a lot more things written by writers who are still alive, and you'll peruse a lot more work that was published in the last 20 years or so. As a result, I know more about K. Ryan than Keats, and I can quote William Carlos Williams more readily than Wordsworth. Some people might think that's a problem, but that's just a strange fixation on the classics. It's as if you can't be a real writer or a real educated person if you haven't read everything that was written prior to 1910. But honestly, that's just silly. There's no rule that you have to read old things, and you don't have to if you don't want to. So not only will you be reading different texts, but you'll also be reading them in a different way. Students of literature are trying to draw out new and nuanced meanings using different theoretical tools, whereas creative writers are reading in order to see what successful writers do. That means, for example, that you'll probably be asking fewer questions about the role of gender in a poem, and more questions about why the lines are arranged on the page in the way that they are. In other words, you won't be examining the coffee table in order to discuss its social and political implications you'll be examining the coffee table in order to figure out how to build one yourself. And for me, that made more sense. I wanted to get better at writing, not better at talking about literature. I just don't like reading that much. So creative writing offered the kind of reading that I was interested in, and of course, the experienced writing that I was looking for. Then, not only did I take creative writing classes in college, but I went on to pursue a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry, and that was an even more concentrated dose of all the same things. More peer review, more reading like a writer, more discussions of writing technique and aesthetic philosophies. And of course, they were all experienced that gave me opportunities to write, revise, and even perform my poetry. In a creative writing program, you won't learn by talking about creative writing, you'll learn by doing it. And of course, I probably don't need to say it, but being able to write things that are as engaging and pleasant as they are communicative 
is a great skill to have. But one of the more valuable and underrated things that I learned by studying creative writing was the ability to give and receive good feedback. Obviously, that pays off now that I'm creating papers, but I've also had colleagues and coworkers approach me asking me to look something over for them, and they've expressed appreciation that I actually took the time to review it carefully and give them thoughtful feedback, rather than just read it quickly and say, looks good. That's something creative writing classes trained me to do, and it's something that will serve you well in any context. If you can identify a problem and communicate a solution clearly and inoffensively, you'll be in great shape wherever teamwork is called for. Oh, but creative writing can be a rewarding thing all by itself. Yes, it can give you valuable skills, but that's not why it's valuable. That's just a bonus. Creative writing is valuable because it can give you a creative outlet and fill your life with artistic enrichment. Remember, there are more ways to assign value to something than just whether or not it's attached to a paycheck. The third major branch of the English department, and another great option for an English major, is to go into rhetoric and composition. Depending on the school you go to, it might go by other names. We'll talk about some of those other specialized labels in a little bit, but rhetoric and composition tend to be the largest umbrella terms that cover a range of different things. The first rhetoric class I took was also the last general education requirement that I filled. I didn't really know what rhetoric was, but it sounded like it was related to things that I cared about. So I took the history of rhetoric and ended up getting a PhD in it. And as you might have noticed, rhetoric serves as the basis for a lot of the things that we talk about on this show. So if you've been around here for any amount of time, you might know that rhetoric is often seen as the study and art of persuasion. You could also think about it as the study of how we use language to get things done. Rhetoric used to be a major component of liberal education, along with grammar and logic. It disappeared for a while, but it came back in the later half of the 20th century, and programs continue to grow. Because of rhetoric's long history, there's an enormous range of things you could do if you study rhetoric and composition. At its most fundamental, rhetorical theory focuses on discourse and how it works. So classes in rhetoric will expose you to the work of rhetorical thinkers like Aristotle and modern theorists like friend of the show Kenneth Burke. So you'll have chances to think about language and audiences and persuasive strategies. In contrast to literature and creative writing, which focus more on literary texts, Students in rhetoric tend to focus more on everyday texts, so you won't probably be reading novels and poems, you'll spend more time thinking about academic essays, speeches, or instruction manuals. In college, I took rhetoric classes that focused on history and theory and practical skills. I took a class on writing style, and I took one on visual rhetoric. We learned about things like typography and even used Photoshop in order to understand how the visual presentation of documents can affect the way that readers and audiences respond to them. Rhetoric and composition is also where you'll encounter classes in business, professional, and technical writing. There you'll get experience drafting resumes, writing product documentation, or even thinking about brand strategies, considering logos, social media strategy, and other things. Or you might have the opportunities to work on proposals for a local nonprofit or to work on literacy projects in a nearby community. Whether through internships or local partnerships, pursuing an English major in this way will give you a lot of practical experience developing writing projects for specific purposes, and will also help you to develop the skills you would need to be an effective communicator in a range of contexts. So because rhetoric is such a broad category, there are a lot of opportunities to pursue whatever is most interesting to you. Obviously, I think rhetoric is the best path to take because it's the one that I took, but it's also usually the least well-known. When people think of English majors, they think of the literary types, and that's why they're always surprised to find out that I'm an English professor who's never read any of the classics. And that's because I used my experience in English to learn about writing and about how to teach it more effectively. I just don't like reading literature and interpreting that much, so don't feel like you can't major in English if you also hate reading a little. It's not always advertised very well, but there's a lot more to an English major than just reading novels. Before we finish, I want to talk about some other things that you might find in an English department or even nearby departments that are still closely related to an English major. And we'll start with linguistics because that's what I actually majored in in college. And often linguistics is a separate department from English, but I've also been in English departments that have linguistics professors who teach linguistics classes. My major focused specifically on the linguistics of English because I knew that I wanted to be a better writer and I thought that learning the workings of the language would help me to do that. Maybe in the same way that 
learning music theory would help somebody to become a better composer. So I learned about things like the history of language and the structure of sounds and the ways that words get their meaning. I also took classes in grammar and usage. English majors often have a reputation for knowing about grammar, but they're also not always required to take classes in grammar. So if you're looking for help with your grammar, find a linguistics student. Not only will they actually know the difference between their coordinating and subordinating conjunctions, but because they're dedicated to the scientific understanding of language, they won't judge you for saying that you're doing good instead of doing well. Either in an English department or a linguistics department, you'll also probably find classes about editing and publication. If those are your career aspirations, look for classes like that to get great practical experience. A lot of English programs also have literary or research journals, and students serve as the editorial staff. So be on the lookout for opportunities to get involved in print or digital journals and to work on things like designing layouts, reading submissions, and coordinating publication if that's the sort of thing you want to go into. Of course, you can also find classes and majors that are about teaching English in middle and high schools. Sometimes those are in English departments, and at other times they're in education departments. In either way, though, they're important if teaching in a K-12 setting is what you want to do. And there are various other things you might find the opportunity to do depending on where you end up. You might find classes about teaching English as a language to speakers of other languages. Maybe you'll have opportunities to take philosophy classes, or you might have the chance to study film and spend your time analyzing movies. The lines between departments and disciplines can get pretty blurry, so there might be different things available at different schools. No matter what, though, the point is that there's more to an English major than you might think. It's a no-brainer if you want to read the literary classics, but even if that's not your kind of thing, you can still find your place by majoring in English. Well, friends, this is where we'll conclude our guided tour of the English major. Obviously, any one of these options could be a whole series of videos by itself, but our goal of today is not to tell you everything you need to know about each and every discipline, but just to give you a little more information that could maybe help you to make a better decision. If I could leave you with just one more bit of unsolicited advice, don't be shy about trying things out in college. It's a time unlike any other to take a variety of classes and learn what you're all about. There's a lot of pressure on students and on schools to prepare you for a job and only for a job. That means that you'll end up feeling like you have to enter school already with a laser focus on what you want to do for the rest of your life, and it also means that schools are sometimes incentivized to discourage exploration and move you through the system as fast as possible. And that's pretty unfortunate. You don't have to know what you're going to do on day one. Figuring all of that out is what college is for. I started out as an English major because that's what I thought I wanted to do. I was wrong, and my time in college gave me the room to figure out what I actually wanted to do once I learned that the world was bigger than the four or five subjects that they taught me in high school. I didn't know what I was going to do after college until the end of my third year, and even though it wasn't required for my major, I took a history of rhetoric class that ended up putting me on the path to where I am now. You don't know what you don't know, and you can't plan on a career if you don't know that it exists. So hopefully this video gives you a better sense of what's out there, and of what it could mean for you to be an English major. And since there is so much more that could be said about each of these options, don't hesitate to ask questions in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. But hey, whatever you do, make sure that it's something that feeds your soul and makes you of service to other people too. Whether that's rhetoric, literature, or civil engineering, I'm not here to tell you what to do, just show you some of the options that are out there. So take care, good luck, and I'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.